Well, thank you for coming. And uh, uh, the name of this presentation is uh, 100 Stories. And don't worry, I'm not going to do 100 stories. I'm going to do six stories today. Um, uh, the whole thing originated back in 1996 when I started, uh, when I became the editor of the Minnesota Legionnaire newspaper. I had been the editor up in Hibbing for about 20 years. and. And uh, I, I realized that nobody, when I took over the Minnesota Legionnaire newspaper, that nobody was reading it. And I knew that because I was getting it at home and I didn't read it. And, and I love newspapers, so if I wasn't reading it, nobody was reading it. And so what do I do? Now I'm, now I'm the editor, and so I did the usual things you can do with a newspaper. I redesigned it, added some features, put in a community calendar, you know, did this and did that. And, and then I thought, well, you know what it's really lacking is stories about veterans. And so I started writing them and uh, it became by far the favorite part of my job to uh, uh, meet with especially the World War II guys. And, and uh, so I, I, we started gathering stories and gathering stories. Well then around, a, after a few years, the, somebody came up to me and they said, well, you know they're building a, a World War II memorial, which was right, actually right outside my office. I work at the Veteran Service Building in St. Paul, and, and I can look out my window towards the Capitol, and there's this place where they were going to put the World War II memorial. And so I thought, well, okay, let's gather these stories into a book and see if we can sell it and raise money for the World War II memorial. So that's what we did. and, and uh, and that's uh, War Stories uh, 1, and uh, it made $70,000 for the World War II Memorial, which was you know, a lot more than we expected, and, and uh, so it was a good project. Then as time went by, people would say, oh, why don't you do another book, you know, because you're gathering, you're writing all these stories, and so we did another one. That was uh, the first book came out in 2002, the second book came out in 2008, and, uh, um, and now, same thing for the third book, and, I, and I, I deliberately call it a trilogy because I don't want anybody to think I'm ever going to do another one <laughs> because they, they take, uh, they, it takes about two years to, to, to write one of these, to put, even though the stories are all written because if you're going to put it in book form, you, re, you want the stories to be flawless, you know, and so I hire two proofreaders, I hire a designer, I hire an artist, uh, and uh, so, so this is the, uh, the new book, War Stories 3. The, the lady on the cover, her name is B.J. Gersey, and she's a, uh, a f from Duluth. She's the first woman uh, from Minnesota to join the Navy in World War II. And, uh, and her story is in the book, and a uh, very interesting lady. She, she lived to be about 92, and right up to the end, she was running uh, women's veterans organizations all over Minnesota, so uh, she was a, a ball of energy. Um, so let's, let's, without further ado, let's move into the stories, and uh, like I say, I'm going to just do six. Uh, they're all pretty short. Uh, they're, they've been in the books, uh, and... Uh, uh, and, I, and so I've kind of picked them out as maybe they're a little funny or maybe unusual or something like that. But, uh, so we're going to start with a uh, Medal of Honor winner. This guy is from, also from Duluth. His name is Mike Colaleo. And uh, he grew up on Raleigh Street in West Duluth, which uh, uh, in the Depression years was a uh, tough neighborhood. Uh, and uh, he, he will... I asked him, did you used to get in fights? And he said, well, uh, well yeah, you know. But, you know so, and, uh, uh, and, and so uh, times are hard, uh, you know, for all these, uh, you know, I, 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 the joke is, you know, that, you know, these people all grew up during the Depression and then their reward was they got to go off to war. And, and, uh, and that was, you know, the case for almost everybody that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, his mom died when he was 16. He quit school to help the family. He talks about going over where the railroad trains were and picking up the coal that fell off the trains. And of course, sometimes there'd be a kid in the neighborhood up on top kicking the coal off the train, you know. But, uh, you know, to heat the houses. And, uh, and then uh, as the war was winding down, he got drafted. 
And on April 7th, 1945, he found himself uh, on a battlefield in uh, Germany. The Americans were, this is uh, the final thrust of the war, Americans were pushing across Germany and, and, uh, and the, his unit was pinned down and, and really pinned down. They were, uh, they couldn't, there were several machine gun nests in front of them, they couldn't move. And, and that's, uh, so Mike decided to try to do something, so he convinced a few other guys to, to, to follow these tanks that were going in. And so they all ran behind the tanks, and, and uh, Mike had what was called a grease gun. It's kind of a small machine gun, and, and, a, and a mortar went off right next to him, and, and the shrapnel hit his gun and, and, uh, and disabled it. And that really made him mad. Now he didn't have a weapon, and he's out here running at the enemy. And, so he climbed on top of one of the tanks and, and, and knocked on the uh, thing, because they were all buttoned up because the shells and the bullets are flying around. And, and he said, can I use your machine gun? They said, yeah, go ahead. And so as the tank advanced, he was up on this machine gun with the bullets whizzing around him. And uh, as, as uh, you know, and I had always wanted to talk to a Medal of Honor winner. And you know, what goes through their mind why are, why are they different you know, than the rest of us? When the rest of us would turn around and run, why do they keep going? And, and so, so at this point, I'm, we're sitting on his couch at his home up in Duluth, and I said, Mike, what was going through your mind? And he looked at me and said, it was just boom, boom, boom. So that's it. That's as, that's as uh, deep as I got into that subject. But it was, uh, um, so he was, he was an amazing guy. Um, he took out uh, three, three machine gun emplacements and they were attacking some more positions. The, the machine gun finally jammed. He wrapped on the thing again. They handed him up a, a Thompson submachine gun. So now he's still standing on top of the tank, you know, in plain view of, you know, the enemy. And, and uh, finally the tanks ran out of ammunition and, and headed back, uh, and on the way back, Mike picked up one of his comrades and carried him a mile back to the to their to the front lines and and saved his life. So, um, so on December 1945, he was requested to appear at the White House, and uh, um, and President Harry S. Truman put the Medal of Honor around his neck and said. I'd rather have one of these than be president of the United States. And uh, so Mike always remembered that. Uh, he, 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 uh, uh, later in life, he, he uh, uh, worked as a, uh, in an iron foundry and, and uh, as a, uh, uh, a longshoreman. He was just kind of a tough guy. And, and, uh, and uh, I said, didn't you ever get job offers? And he said, yeah, they always wanted a talker, and I'm not a talker. So, uh, but he's a great, great guy. Uh, second story is a guy from, I uh, grew up in Massachusetts, uh, but he moved to Chatfield, Minnesota. His name is Frank Kinney. And uh, Frank joined the Navy uh, to get away from the farm and the poverty in, in 1938. And then like happened to so many people that were already in the service when the war broke out, uh, they just got extended uh, without their approval and uh, for the duration of the war. And that's what happened to Frank. And so, uh, so he was serving on the USS Wasp, great big aircraft carrier. And he was down, he was an engine man. So he was way down in the bottom of the ship. I, I also served on an aircraft carrier, and I tell you, you don't want to go down there because it's 120 degrees, and, and the work is hard, and, and, uh, and if you have claustrophobia, it's not a good place to be either. But uh, that's where he worked, and uh, on uh, September 15th, 1942, near the Solomon Islands, while he was protecting, while the American fleet was protecting the invasion of Guadalcanal, which is really America's first invasion of the war, at least in the Pacific. Um, they uh, sent a spray of torpedoes toward the American fleet, and three of them hit the Wasp, and that's what it looked like. So now you got to imagine poor little Frank Kinney is down in the hold of this ship, uh, in, the, in the bowels of the ship, and all the lights are out, all the communication is gone, 
and, and they don't know what to do except they're just paralyzed with fear, he said. And, and, uh, um, and finally, because there was no communication, they actually had to send people down to the various parts of the ship and say, come up, abandon ship, and that's what they did. And so they, they fought their way up, you know, because you couldn't go this way and you couldn't go that way because of the flames. And they finally got up to the top, jumped off the side of the ship, and, and he joined a group of about a dozen guys that were uh, um, holding on to a net that had cork in it, so it was floating. So, th so they could grab onto this net and float along with it. And uh, it was... Uh, uh, a little precarious, and but within a few minutes, a destroyer headed right for them. So they got they they were really happy about that, and and the destroyer came closer and came closer, and then started dropping depth charges, because the destroyer wasn't coming to rescue them. The destroyer was coming to bomb the submarine that had destroyed the wasp. So um, luckily for these guys, they had somebody with them, uh, a pilot off the carrier who had gone through survival training. And he knew that uh, when, when bombs go off in the water, it can be very serious for people who are in the water that change of pressure can, you know, it's one of those, uh, I talked with somebody about this and they said, you know, that they look at the bodies and there's nothing wrong with them, but you know, their insides are all torn up. So, um, so what the guy told them is they, they had to insert a finger up their rectum to keep the pressure from uh, getting inside their bodies. And so um, that's what they did, and uh, they survived, and then a little about, so now they're out there for three more hours waiting for another destroyer to come by, and finally one started heading for them again, and, and, uh, and Frank, he said, there's a quote, he said, it's too bad Hollywood wasn't there to film the rescue. Here are 12 guys with one arm holding onto the net and the other arm underwater with their fingers up their rear ends. So he survived. He went to the USS Princeton, and it was, it was sunk. And then he was assigned to a destroyer that just went up and down in front of San Francisco Bay, and he thought that was just fine duty. He didn't want to go down for the third time. But uh, he settled in, uh, settled in Chatfield. He worked for the American Breeders Association, and. Uh, uh, had a good life. Somewhere in the 90s, when I started doing these stories, I kept hearing about this guy, they called him the Silver Star Chaplain. And uh, his name was Delbert Keel. He's from Alexandria, Minnesota. He, uh, he was a minister before the war started. And so when the war started, he thought, I'm gonna use my, my skills and I'm gonna go be with the men. and. So he signed up and uh, they sent him to uh, uh, paratrooper school at Fort Benning. And uh, I, I just gotta tell you one little side thing. I, I showed up at Delbert's house in Alexandria in the middle of winter. It was like 25 below zero outside and I knocked on the door and his wife came to the door and, and she said, Delbert's not here, he's out ice fishing. So I thought, this is a tough guy, you know. And, so, uh, so he finally, he showed up a little while later and, and it, it was one of the, um, he's maybe the favorite, my favorite interview of all time. It was just, uh, he's just an incredible guy and, and uh, very warm and, and uh, welcoming. Uh, he, uh, so he was, he's at Fort Benning and he decides, well, he better get on about with the Lord's service. And so he, uh, he posted, uh, leaflets all over the post uh, calling for a service at a certain time at the base chapel and and the appointed time came and two people showed up and one of them was drunk and so he was he was crushed you know he thought you know this is and so he went he went and he prayed and and he says this is what God told him he said Delbert if the men won't come to you you have to go to the men so he took it on himself to do every piece of training that the men were doing at Fort Benning. All the weapons, all the, he did all the jumps. Uh, and, uh, and so then he, they sent him overseas. Their, their first jump for the, he was in the 509th Parachute Infantry Regiment. And uh, the first jump was at Sicily. And you know, they had all practiced jumping out of airplanes. And of course the pilots had practiced uh, you know, dropping the men in the right place and things like that. But 
Apparently the pilots were unaware that anybody was going to be shooting at them at, when they're trying to drop the men off. And so, uh, but that, that was the case. And, uh, and so they opened the door and dropped the men in the wrong place, in a, in a very bad place. And, and he said, Delbert said, his chute opened and his feet hit the ground at the same time. And that was, you know, you're going way too fast. And so it knocked him unconscious. It, it, uh, it did severe uh, damage to internal organs. Uh, but he never told anybody because he didn't want to be taken off the line. You know, he didn't want to be sent home or anything like that. So, so that, was, that was his first jump. They, uh, the next action was at uh, uh, Salerno. Uh, the next action was at Anzio. Uh, they didn't. I, they didn't jump into those. They were just. They, they landed on the beach. But uh, you know, Anzio was a very tough spot. Um, uh, and he had. And Delbert kind of made his reputation there by going foxhole to foxhole and talking to the men, talking to the men. What do you need? How can I help you? And uh, so, one day at Anzio, they, 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 he got tired of being strafed all the time. The Mess Messerschmitts would fly over and strafe the beach all the time where they were uh, trapped. And, uh, and he got tired of it, and he saw an M1 standing there, and he picked it up, and he snapped off a few shots at this Messerschmitt as it went over and didn't think anything of it, put the gun back. And, and uh, a few minutes later, a guy came running up the line, and he says, uh, who fired at that Messerschmitt? It, it, went, it's, it started smoking and it crashed up here. And Delbert kept his mouth shut. He said he could, he could see the headlines in Stars and Stripes newspaper. Chaplin shoots down fighter, you know, and he said that wouldn't, so. So he said he never picked up a weapon again the rest of the war and uh, probably he wasn't supposed to pick that one up either. So um, next jump was, uh, We'll go through some of these slides, but uh, his next jump was, uh, that's him in his full regalia, uh, was into Operation Market Garden. And I don't know if, how much you know about World War II, but Market Garden was uh, a plan devised by the British. Um, there's a movie that was made of it called A Bridge Too Far. And the idea of, of this operation was there were a series of bridges uh, uh, from Holland into Germany, and, and they thought if they could capture those bridges, they could get the troops across and, uh, and maybe shorten the war by six months. Uh, it was a good idea, but a bad plan, and it didn't work. They could never capture the final bridge, and that's why they call it a bridge too far. Well, the 509th job was to, or the 82nd Airborne's job, uh, which was where the 509th was located, was to capture these uh, two bridges at Niemagen, uh, the Netherlands, and and they were side by side in this in this village, and and uh, and they uh, it, it wasn't working. The the Germans held fast, uh, and uh, so it, it became kind of a desperate situation. The timing had to be that you know they had to capture a bridge, capture a bridge, capture a bridge, and and it wasn't happening. So they decided they would call up uh, some boats. And uh, it took all day for the boats to arrive. When they did, uh, they, they, weren't, they weren't Navy boats like I would know about. They were Army boats. So they were made out of wood and canvas, which is you know, not real uh, hardy materials. Uh, and so they, they got in the boats. There were 26 boats. Uh, Delbert Keel snuck into one of them. And uh, he wasn't course supposed to go over with the, with the troops but he snuck into one of the boats and uh, out of the 26 boats that went across this 400 foot expanse of water uh, 13 of them were sunk um, the guy next to Delbert had his head blown off um, but they landed and Delbert spent the rest of the day um, between the front lines and the beach carrying men back that, so they could be evacuated, men, wounded men. And you have to understand that Delbert is only uh, five foot six, 120 pounds. So he's carrying all these guys back. He was leaning over a uh, wounded uh, uh, comrade and, and giving him his last rites and a mortar went off right behind him. And so it filled his back with shrapnel. So the day went on and uh, 
uh, they're bringing more troops over on the few boats they had left and an, an officer happened to show up and he saw Delbert standing there covered with blood from head to foot, his back was all bloody, but he could see the, the, uh, the cross on his lapel and he said, Chaplain, what are you doing here? And Delbert said, well, this is where the men are, sir. And uh, so I gotta tell you, just one more, and that's for that he earned the Silver Star. And there weren't a lot of chaplains in World War II that earned a Silver Star, so. Um, I gotta tell you one more Delbert story. It's the end of the war now, the, the uh, 82nd Airborne has gone all the way into Austria and they're, and they're waiting, probably waiting to you know, go over to the Pacific if the war went on over there. But uh, they're waiting and uh, so Delbert called for a service. They got one of the local churches and he called for a service. Well now hundreds of guys showed up. Everybody knew Delbert and they, uh, they had a nickname for him. They called him the Jumping Jesus. So, um, so He's, uh, he had a cold, he just happened to have a cold the day of the service, so he had a uh, um, hanky in his, in his jacket pocket when he was pulling it out, and some of the other officers noticed that he's doing this, and they thought, what a great prank if we could. Uh, so they, they, they took a, uh, when Delbert took off his jacket for a while, he, he, they, they took some silk women's panties and replaced his, uh, his uh, handkerchief with those. And they thought, boy, this is gonna be great during the service to have the chaplain pull out these panties out of his pocket. And, and so, but Delbert uh, came, put his jacket back on, he looked and he saw what they were doing. So he, he switched them back. So, so now he's doing his sermon and, uh, and uh, he's going along and, and uh, he'd reach for his pocket. And of course, all the officers are in the front row. They all lean forward. <laughs> And he'd, and he'd take his hand away and they'd all lean back. And, and, uh, and this happened several times. He'd, you know, he'd reach for it and they'd all and, and they'd not lean back. And finally he came to the end of his sermon and he, and he whipped out the handkerchief. And he said he had never seen such a look of disappointment on American officers' faces during the war. So he... Uh, ended his... Uh, uh, when, he, when the war was over, uh, he finally had to take care of his wounds, which he had never taken care of during the war. He spent 15 months in three different army hospitals. Uh, and then he went to be a missionary. He was a missionary in Japan, and, uh, and then he came home and he, was, uh, he worked with other missionaries that were going overseas and, and finally retired up to Alexandria where he could go ice fishing whenever he wanted to. So, great guy. Um, just one little sidelight, they estimate that he carried 35 men to safety during, during that battle. So. Leon Frankel is a Jewish kid from St. Paul. And uh, he grew up in a little neighborhood. Uh, if you know where Regions Hospital is in St. Paul, there, at one time there was a Jewish neighborhood there. Uh, Leon said they had, they had two shuls, the, the red, they call them the red shul and the white shul by what color the buildings were. And, and he said, you didn't want to go in the wrong one. So I, that's, and that's about all I know about Jewish religion is that you don't want to go in the wrong shul, but anyway. He, was, he joined the Navy right at the beginning of the war and uh, signed up to be a pilot and he was accepted and uh, he went off and he flew, uh, there's, he is in training, and he flew uh, these airplanes, they're called Avengers, they were torpedo bombers. And it was the largest single engine airplane that the, that the United States had during the war and I, happened to stand next to one a couple of years ago when I went to a, a naval museum, and they are just enormous. They're like a, a small bomber, but they flew off of aircraft carriers and carried torpedoes and, and, and sometimes bombs. So he was a squadron pilot aboard the USS Yorktown, and in fact, uh, one of his torpedoes hit a Japanese cruiser and sunk it, and so he got a Navy Cross, which is the second highest uh, uh, Valor Award that you can get right below Medal of Honor. Uh, he was, uh, uh, flew 25 missions and then came back to the United States and uh, in San Francisco and one day he was hanging out 
uh, in the squadron offices and the captain or the commander called him in and said, uh, uh, Delbert, do me a favor. He said, uh, my wife is coming into the airport today. Will you drive over and pick her up? And he flipped him his car keys. Delbert said, sure thing. And he walked out of the office and now he's got a problem because he doesn't know how to drive. <laughs> This is a guy who's, who's, been, who's got like 150 carrier landings and, and this huge beast of an airplane and everything else and he cannot drive a car because he never has. So he, he said he took the car and he drove it around. He didn't know how to shift it. He drove it around the tarmac for about an hour and finally he, he figured. And so he, he actually did go to uh, pick up uh, the camp commander's wife. Um, just one more thing about uh, 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 Leon is, is that he, one day in 1948, he was home, he was selling cars out in North Dakota or something like that, and he got a phone call. That's Leon right in front, by the way, with looking really cool with the sidearm. Uh, and and uh, he got a call, and it was like a guy you could tell the guy was calling from a phone booth and he was whispering into the phone. And it was a, a guy from uh, the newly created nation of Israel. And uh, he said, uh, 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 Leon, we need your skills. We want you to join the 101st Squadron, which was Israel's first and most famous uh, fighter squadron. And, and so he agreed to do it. And when he, when he got to... Uh, Israel finally, and they started bringing the planes in. He found out what they would be flying or, uh, were Messerschmitts that were made in Czechoslovakia. It was the only thing they could buy. You know, nobody would sell to Israel in those days. So, uh, um, and they were poorly made because they, were, they weren't made by, you know, Germ they weren't made in Germany. They were made by other people, and yeah, they were kind of held together by, you know, baling wire and chewing gum. And, and, uh, and as Leon said, uh, uh, as he got into uh, the German airplane and put on his German helmet and his, and his German uh, uh, life vest and everything, he said, the irony was not lost on this Jewish kid from St. Paul, you know. But he met, he flew 25 more missions and, uh, and they finally, one of them crashed while he was flying it and he said, that's enough and he went home. So, but uh, he's, he was forever revered. He went back to Israel many times and uh, as a member of that original 101st Squadron, it was, you know, he's a, a hero in Israel. Um, so he retired, uh, uh, you know, finally from all warfare and uh, went back to business. He was a businessman in uh, um, Minneapolis. Ken Dahlberg was a kid who grew up in uh, Wilson, Wisconsin. He, uh, uh, couldn't, they had no high school there, and so he came to St. Paul to Humboldt High School and, and went to school there and uh, worked. His first job was washing pots and pans at the St. Paul Hotel, and uh, he worked his way up to, in the Pick Nicola chain. Uh, he, he, was, he was actually the produce manager for the whole Pick Nic Pick, I know it wasn't Pick Nicola, it was the Pick Hotel chain. Pick Nicola was the one in Minneapolis for people who are old enough to remember the picnicklet, and, uh, and he ended up in Indianapolis. Uh, he knew uh, a lot of the Notre Dame people, or not in Indianapolis, in, in Indiana, uh, in South Bend, and he knew a lot of the uh, Notre Dame people, so when it came time to apply to be a uh, uh, pilot, he had some good references, and he got selected to be a pilot. He went, uh, he, was shot, he was shot down three times during the war, uh, but he shot down 15 uh, German planes, which made him a triple ace. There are only a handful of pilots that, that were able to do that, knock down, uh, you know, 15 enemy planes. So he, he always said he was, he was a, you know, he, had, he was ahead by 12, you know, at the end. But the first time he was shot down was uh, right over Paris, and he managed to uh, get back to the American lines. I, I was, one of these stories that you, he had to be there, I guess, but they, they didn't have ketchup in, in uh, uh, France, but they, they found some kind of red sauce and they put a Band-Aid on his head and, and put red all over it. And he and another Frenchman, 
drove their bicycles right through the German lines to the American lines and, uh, and got away with it somehow. So, so he went back to flying. He is, his second time he was shot down was uh, in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, uh, he was, here I should, this is one of the planes that he flew. It's called Shillelagh. I think this is the one that crashed in Paris. Um, another one he flew was called Little Horse. He's standing in front of it there. Um, so he's flying, a, you know, if you recall the Battle of the Bulge, uh, uh, it, the Germans had a lot of initial, initial success, and part of it was because the, uh, there was, uh, the sky was gray and you couldn't fly. And, and uh, so they, they, uh, um, they weren't able to fly until Christmas Day, which was about six days into the battle. And, and finally they could, and so they're up there and they're looking for targets. And, and Ken got hit. Uh, his plane got hit, and uh, he had a choice. He could uh, bail out or he could try to land it. Um, and there was a foot of snow on the ground, so he thought he'd try to land it. It looked pretty soft down there. And he came down behind, behind enemy lines, and uh, uh, it wasn't a soft landing. He was bounced around pretty good, hurt his arm, uh, was almost knocked out. and. And he got out of the plane, and he was standing on the wing of the plane. Well, meanwhile, some uh, a tank unit was nearby. An American tank unit was nearby, uh, and they didn't take a tank over there, but they jumped in their jeep and took a jeep over to where they saw the plane crash. And uh, they pulled up, and uh, there's this guy standing on the wing, waving his his service revolver around, and. And uh, they pulled up and they said, come on quick, because, you know, they're about five miles behind the enemy lines, and come on quick, let's go. And, and uh, Ken looked at him and, and he said, what's the password of the day? And they, and they said, we don't know what the password of the day is, but if you don't get in the Jeep in about 10 seconds, we're going to leave you here. So he got down and got in the Jeep and got rescued. So he flew some more. Um, and on uh, Valentine's Day of 1945, uh, he got shot down for the third time, and now he spent four months in a German POW camp. He didn't escape. He tried to escape, but he uh, got caught twice and uh, uh, was sent to this POW camp. Um, during the time he was, a PO, he was uh, at the camp, his, uh, uh, he kept accumulating pay. And so when he got out of the service, finally, in, in uh, you know, Whenever it was later, 1945, he had about uh, two or three thousand dollars in back pay that he had. So he, he went and started a, a little electronics firm in uh, uh, Golden Valley, Minnesota, and uh, and that company eventually became known as Miracle Ear, and and so he did well for himself. Uh, time went on, and and uh, he he uh, got a when he was training, he, he, he actually trained pilots before he went overseas. His uh, tent mate was a guy at, at a base in Yuma, Arizona, was a guy named Barry Goldwater. And they became very close friends. And uh, so later on, in 1964, Barry Goldwater ran for president. And, uh, and so he asked Ken to be his... Uh, 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 Midwest campaign chairman, which meant raise money, you know, from the big the big wheels in the Midwest, and and Ken, of course, knew everybody, and so it was a good job for him. He didn't want to do it because he didn't like politics, and he told Barry, "I don't, I, I don't like, you know, politics. I'm a businessman." And, and Barry says he prevailed, and so Ken did it. Well, he liked it. He found out he enjoyed, you know, raising money that way, and uh, he could go to both Democrats and Republicans and get money and. And uh, so when, when Nixon ran in 68, Nixon asked him to do the same job, and he did. And when Nixon ran again in 72, uh, he was doing the same job again. And I'll just skip to, I won't go through all the details, but a check, a cashier's check with Ken's name on it was the check that ended up in the hands of the Watergate burglars. And so now Ken is embroiled, not only is he doesn't like politics, now he's embroiled in probably the top political scandal of the 20th century. And uh, so they, they subpoenaed him and had him come down to, uh, 
uh, Dade County, Florida, which is where they had arrested the burglars, and, uh, and they just grilled him. They wanted to know where that money had come from and how it got from his hands to the national, they call it a creep committee to reelect the president, uh, how it got there and then how it got to the, because this was a smoking gun in, in the whole Watergate thing. And, and uh, so they just grilled him unmercifully for, uh, for hours and hours. And finally, it's time to go home. And so the, the Dade County prosecutor, you know, said, can I give you a ride home back to your hotel? And Ken said, yeah, sure. And so, so as, as happens when two, two World War II guys are together, and, uh, you know, they start saying, you know, what did you during the, do during the war? And, you know, and uh, so they asked each other and, uh, and the, the, uh, the prosecutor told Ken that he had been a, a tank commander during the war. And uh, he said, what did you do? And Ken said, well, I was a fighter pilot. And the, the, the guy said, the tank guy says, you know, he says, I, you know, I only knew one fighter pilot in the whole war, and, and, uh, and he was the dumbest SOB I ever met. And Ken was kind of offended by this. He says, well, what do you mean? He said, he said, we saw this plane crash behind enemy lines. We drove our Jeep in. We see this guy standing on the wing, waving his revolver around, going, what's the password of the day? And, and so Ken turned to him and said, How's your driver Ernie doing these days? <laughs> that story was on the front page of the Miami Herald the next day, and uh, so it was an interesting uh, thing. And, and uh, so, so Ken, as I said, uh, he he did well. Uh, Miracle Air, he sold it for about 200 million. He had a, some money left over. His his son-in-law had bought uh, a couple of restaurants in Ohio, and they weren't doing really well. And Ken got involved and hired some management and invested a bunch of money and that, that became a, a little restaurant chain called Buffalo Wild Wings, which he can owned right up to the time he died. He was about 93 when he died, but I, I went with him on a trip when he was about 92. Uh, I did a book on Ken. It's right over there called One Step Forward. Uh, it's, uh, and so we, we, were, we flew on a corporate jet and they can't fly all the way across the Atlantic so they, they stopped somewhere and so we stopped in Iceland and, and uh, I, wasn't, I was there but I wasn't, I ha I wasn't with uh, the group when this happened but, uh, but Ken was standing somewhere in this restaurant bar kind of place in, in, the, in Iceland and, and three beautiful Icelandic women came in, blonde hair and, and, uh, and Ken looked at them longingly and said, oh, to be 90 again. <laughs> so, so anyway. So finally a story, uh, those stories are all from the uh, first two books. Uh, this story is from the uh, last book, War Stories 3. Uh, and it's a little more somber story. I can't think of any American soldier that had a, a tougher time in World War II than, than Anton Sitchi. Uh, he uh, uh, grew up in uh, Urbank, Minnesota. Again, tough times. Uh, he quit school when he was in eighth grade to help his dad out uh, in a well, he was a well driller, but he couldn't, couldn't drill in the winter time, so he would go out on the, on the lakes and uh, uh, it was legal to net tulabies. Anybody know what tulabi is? It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a rough fish, but it's edible. And uh, uh, so he was, he was out one day netting tulabies, and uh, there was another group of guys little ways away uh, uh, fishing also, and all of a sudden these guys gathered up their stuff and they kind of hustled right past uh, Anton, Tony, and, uh, and they dropped a fish in the pile of fish that he had, and he didn't pay much attention to it. He was kind of, where are those guys going? And he turned around, and here's a game warden. And the game warden says, what are you doing with that northern pike there with the, uh, you know, while you're netting, you know, these tulipies? And he said, I don't know, where I, you know, I, I, these guys dropped, a, you know, and they went, sure, sure, sure. So he got, he got sentenced to uh, 90 days or $90. Well, we all know what our choice would be these days. You know, $90 even in the 1930s wasn't that much, but they didn't have it. So he served 90 days. The day he walked out of jail, uh, he got his draft, they handed him his draft notice. So, uh, so he was on a roll. 
and uh, he got assigned to the 194th Tank Battalion out of Bemidji, which is a very famous outfit, because uh, they all did the Bataan Death March. And uh, so he got sent over to the Philippines. Uh, see if I'm leaving any slides behind here. So he got sent over to the Philippines and uh, uh, they bombed, uh, the Japanese bombed uh, Clark and Nichols Fields on December 8th, 1941. And uh, the, the 194th and all the American army was pushed back, pushed back down the the peninsula, the Bataan Peninsula, and finally they surrendered. Uh, and so everybody has their own story about, you know, the Bataan Death March. For his story is that it took seven days for uh, for him to uh, do this march. They only fed them once in seven days, and he said he walked up with his plate, and the the guy slinging the food missed his plate, and it all went on the ground. He said he. Or as he ate it anyway. Um, so he finally got, uh, uh, they walked about 60 miles, uh, then they got into boxcars. They were so tightly packed that uh, you, you, you could only stand up. Um, the way he said he survived that is he, he was along the edge and there was a crack in the boxcar and he could put his mouth up against it and breathe fresh air. But he said, Several guys died in the boxcars, you know, two or three day trip. They finally got to a, a camp called Camp O'Donnell, uh, which had been an American, this is more of the death march, uh, it had been, an, uh, I think, an American camp that was taken over and, and uh, incredibly bad conditions for all the uh, uh, men there and, and uh, uh, guys dying left and right, and, uh, and, and uh, Anton Sitchi got malaria, but he said he's able to scrounge up some cigarette butts and trade them for quinine, and that, that helped him. Uh, he said it, it had reached a point where pretty soon there were not enough healthy guys to do a burial detail. So when, when one of, uh, of Sitchi's friends died, they, uh, they told him to take the dead body, he had to carry it himself, two miles into the jungle and then dig the grave and bury the guy himself. Uh, he spent his time, he said, their only occupation they had was scrounging food. And uh, he said he just every guy there was spent his whole day trying to find food. He said in the rainy season, you could find night crawlers. They gave you strength. I ate a lot of grass. I ate the leaves off the trees. He got something called the wet berry berry. There's a dry and a wet berry berry. The wet kind was where your legs swell up and if you don't take care of it, they eventually just burst from, uh, so he had that. Uh, they, they eventually moved him to uh, uh, Cabachuan, which was another uh, prisoner of war camp. And he said it was a little bit better there. He said he worked in a garden for Japanese officers. And of course they told him, you know, never, never, ever touch the food, but you, you know, human survival will take over. And he said he, he had just put a turnip in his mouth one day when a guard came up behind him. And, and uh, he, in, so he said he swallowed the turnip whole. And, uh, and uh, life goes on. He was sent to uh, Bilibad Prison, uh, which is down in Manila, because the, the, uh, uh, the Japanese were aware that, that MacArthur was going to make good on his I shall return, you know, he, that he was going to come back and, and they wanted to put, move these prisoners to Japan or to Manchuria or somewhere else where they could have them do slave labor. And so they put them aboard these ships that were called hell ships. This, this is the one that Anton Sitchi was on. It's called the Arizan Maru. It, uh, they call them hell ships for a couple of reasons, or maybe more than a couple of reasons, but one reason is that the, the conditions on board were unbelievable. You, you couldn't, uh, it, the way the guys had to lay down were, was, because uh, um, there wasn't enough room, was you laid with your head, with your body between the other guy's legs and your head on his chest, and then somebody else laid with his head on your chest, and that's the only way they could fit in. And, and he said, and then if you had to get up to use the facility, which was a five gallon can in the middle of the hold, you know, which was spilling all over, he said you had to step over, you know, everybody. And, and uh, 
And so a lot of guys were dying. They were out at sea for 13 days and they got spotted by an American submarine, which is the second reason they call these hell ships because uh, you know, an American submarine cannot tell that that ship is carrying American soldiers. And there were 1,600, there were 1,800 on board that ship. And uh, he said, uh, you know, down in the hold, so they could hear, they could hear three torpedoes being fired. And he said the first one went and missed the front end of the ship. Second one went and missed the back end of the ship. The third one hit him square on and, and, and broke the ship in half and then immediately started going down. Um, he, uh, they were all trapped, there was no light down there. He said, but somebody opened the hatch. So um, a, a Japanese sailor opened the hatch. And uh, so they had light, they could cry, call, crawl up the ladders and get up to the deck. Uh, uh, Sitchi is always a uh, uh, resourceful, you know, if you live as long as he had in his conditions. Uh, so he went to, they found the kitchen and they found some food and they're stuffing rice into their pockets. And he said he found a, uh, uh, a container of, of brown sugar and he filled up his cup and he ate it all right there. He said, bad idea. He said he was throwing up green and, you know, but so. Now the ship is starting to go down and, and uh, he, he found some uh, 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 canteens, empty canteens, and he strapped them to his arms and to his legs. And that way he had uh, a flotation device. And so he, he jumped in the water and he was gonna swim over to one of the other Japanese ships. And he looked over and he said, all the, is this American uh, soldiers swam over to that ship the, the Japanese guards were just hitting them with uh, rifle butts and keeping them from getting on board. So the upshot of the thing was uh, um, out of the 1,800 men, uh, only seven survived uh, that ship going down. And, and so Sitchi's in the water, he's got his canteens, he's floating, he's in the water for about five hours. Um, they, yeah, and, and now night is here and, and the moonlight, you know, the moonlight comes across the water. Well, you could see a boat way down at the end of this reflection. And so he swam toward it and, uh, and he got closer and closer. And finally they were yelling, the guys in the boat were Americans. They were yelling at him, come on, come on. And, and he said he just ran out of gas, but he found a, happened to find a board in the water at that point. And he got on the board and did kind of a surfboard thing up to the, the boat. and climbed in and, and, and passed out. Um, so there, there were a total of five men on board uh, this, this little boat. And uh, then they were hundreds of miles away from nowhere. They had no idea where they were. Um, but this is when the miracles started to happen. Uh, there was, they were in the boat. It was half filled with water. Uh, and there was a thud up against the side of the boat. And they looked over the side and it was a crate. And they hauled the crate in and opened it up and it was the sail for the boat. Of course, they didn't have a mast, but they had a sail. Uh, and then a few, you know, a little while later, some more thuds and, they, and little casks of water that were, and they, so they hauled them in. So then they had some tools they found and they could finally bail out the boat and uh, in the, they found in the bottom of the boat uh, a, a little cache of food, some hardtack. And so now they had food, they had water, and then another thud up against the side of the boat, and they look, and it's the mast for the sail. So, uh, you know, you tell me what the odds are, you know, of that happening. Um, so they, they, uh, they were in the water for about three days. They knew if they headed west, they'd find China somewhere. Uh, there's uh, the, you can see the, the coast of China, they were, they were probably, well, I don't know where they went ashore, but, but they were, the whole, the whole coastline of China was controlled by the Japanese. And so it was a very dangerous spot to be, even though they, they had come in and they said, uh, uh, after three days they saw a fishing boat and the fishing boat came out and rescued them. And, and Sitchi said, we had a tough time explaining to them who we were and what we were doing there. You have to understand we're only wearing G-strings because that's what the prisoners wore. Uh, so the, the, the Chinese sailors uh, fed them and, uh, and clothed them. Uh, 
and uh, and got them to shore, and and they uh, and so they had to quick get off the shore and and go inland as fast as they could. So they walked 30 miles that first day until their uh, feet were bloody and they they couldn't walk anymore. They had no shoes. And so they got to a little town, and the uh, Chinese mayor was so grateful to see Americans uh, that he gave each of these five guys uh, $2,000 in Chinese money. I don't know what, what the monetary equivalent is, but they, he said he spent $700 of that for uh, a pair of shoes. And these are uh, the actual shoes. He kept them till the day he died, and those are... You can see on the shoe closest to you, the dark stains are the blood from his feet. And uh, uh, so, he, so now he had shoes, and, and so they used a combination of trucks and bicycles and walking, and they finally got 600 miles in, inland, and uh, they were uh, finally got to a base where there were Americans. And they, they sent in a plane and, and got them out, and they, it was a long, you know, they had to go to India, over the hump to India, and then to Morocco, and then finally they got across to, uh, to America. And uh, so this is, they were the first group of prisoners of war that had, in the Pacific, that had escaped or had gotten away. And so the army was intensely interested in, you know, the conditions in the camps and uh, uh, they, were, they were most interested, you know, and, and they wanted to know if the Japanese were going to kill all the prisoners if it came to that at some point. And so they, they were, they were kind of grilled, uh, interrogated for nine days. And at night, though, they let them go out to the nightclubs and have a good time, and, you know, and then next day they'd be back at it again. This picture here, they're standing with General Marshall, who was the... Uh, 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 head general of the United States Army. He was, uh, he's as high as you can go. And, uh, and that's Sitchi on the far right. Uh, and so they, they, uh, they got through that and, uh, and they sent Sitchi back to Minnesota and they were trying to find a job for him. Well, first they asked him if he wanted to guard Japanese prisoners and, and uh, he said, you mean with a gun? And they said, yeah. And he said, well, you wouldn't have any prisoners left. So they decided that wasn't a good job for him. So they sent him back to Minnesota and, and they had him working at Fort Snelling on the golf course. And this is when the uh, uh, golf course was down on the river bluffs. And, uh, and so he was mowing the lawns there in these big riding lawnmower tractors. And, and it was a pretty good job, but he wanted to get out. You know, he'd, he'd had enough of, you know, he thought he had done his part in the war and he wanted to, it was, the war had actually ended now in, in uh, uh, Europe and it was about to end in, in uh, Japan and, and so he wanted to get out and, and he kept telling people when are you going to let me out, when are you going to let me out and so he's out there mowing the lawn one day and an officer came out and he said when are you going to let me out and the officer said well uh, you know you're doing such a good job we thought we'd keep you on until the end of the golf season. And Sitchi said, I didn't have to take that. So he, he walked up to the lawn mowing machine and turned on the ignition and put it in gear and he and the officer watched as it went across the field, over the bluff and down into the Minnesota River. And, he said, and Sitchi said, I never heard a word about it. And two weeks later he had his discharge papers and he came home. So he spent, uh, uh, oh, this is, this is, there was some notoriety to this, this was a, a picture that appeared in the in the New York Times. Uh, uh, he's the second from the left, and uh, so he went back to uh, Dent, Minnesota. And uh, uh, when I interviewed him, he was 95 years old. He had plowed his driveway that morning. He was in good health, uh, uh, but it wasn't. You know, it'd be nice to say that it was uh, a uh, you know everything was wonderful in the end because uh, uh, it wasn't. He had, he had severe PTSD for his entire life. He could only sleep about three hours every night. Um, he had the shakes. He had, he had dysentery almost his whole life. So, uh, so he, he always bore the wounds of, of war. And, uh, but he was, uh, uh, he was in good spirits the day I talked to him. And, uh, and uh, he died in, he happened to die in 2009.
So thank you so much for being a good audience. And uh, uh, again, uh, the book is called uh, War Stories. Uh, it can be uh, purchased on uh, the Legion website if you're interested, mnlegion.org. Uh, and uh, uh, and it's, you can, in fact, you can buy all three books there. And, uh, uh, but I, but uh, there's other other stories in this book that are interesting. Uh, there's a guy who was actually one of the Band of Brothers from Minnesota. Uh, everybody's seen that series, I think. There's a guy named Peter Thompson. He's a, an Ojibwe Indian from the White Earth Reservation. He was wounded six times in Vietnam. Uh, I, I said I said Peter, didn't you ever learn how to duck? And he laughed. But yeah. Um, uh, there's a guy who, uh, down in Cannon Falls, who ended up with Herman Goering's Iron Cross. They keep it in a safety deposit box. It's, it came right from Herman's chest to this guy's hands. It was an interesting story. And, and a story about a, a, a guy that served on uh, the USS Arizona on the original uh, Pearl Harbor Day and somehow survived that, which is, he was one of the few. Uh, so it's a lot of good stories in the book, and, and, and the idea is to, you know, preserve these stories and, and uh, uh, so we don't forget them. We're coming up on Memorial Day, and, and uh, it's uh, just, that's been, the, I guess, the main uh, idea behind the whole project is to, is to keep the stories alive and, and uh, so that uh, when we lose all these World War II guys and, and we've almost lost 95% of them, I'd say, by now, so that their stories can live on because of the incredible time.